This is Delhi. Please stand by for our next program. This is All India Radio. We now bring you a panel discussion entitled Mulkraj Anand, Writer for All Ages. The panelists are Shri M. K. Tikku, veteran journalist and writer, Humra Qureshi, columnist and writer, Ravi Singh, well known publisher, and Preeti Gill, writer and literary agent who initiates and moderates this discussion. Mulkraj Anand, Writer for All Ages. Welcome to the national program of Talks English. Our discussion today is on Mulkraj Anand, a writer for all ages. The Indian novelist Mulkraj Anand passed away in 2004 and he was 98 and arguably one of the greatest exponents of Indian writing in English. He was certainly among the earliest along with Raja Rao and R.K. Narayan and uh, he was probably the first also to gain an international readership. He espoused left-wing politics and during his student years, he spoke with passion at the meetings of the Indian League. His novels and short stories have acquired the status of classics and they are noted for their perceptive insight into the lives of the oppressed. Our guests today who are going to be talking about Mulkraj, his life and his times, are Mr. M. K. Tikku, writer and veteran journalist, Humra Qureshi, writer and columnist, and Ravi Singh, senior and well-known publisher. So my first question, I think, to you, Ravi. Can you give us an insight into his writing, his times, his politics, and how these three came together so successfully when he wrote his novels? Well, actually, I'm you know, glad you asked me that because for me, that is what makes him really an important writer. And um, especially now, I would think at any time, but especially now, because for him, politics and literature could not be separate. And his literature was, uh, you know, deep social engagement. Now, for a number of reasons why I say that he's, you know, that kind of writer has to be valued today is, number one, of course, because, you know, there is this thing of keeping politics out of any kind of art and this, and you know, privileging technology and science. And, you know, because these are, ideas are dangerous. Mm. Therefore, you can be an artist and you can be a scientist as long as you. And that, I think, is a dangerous position and also kind of depletes us as individuals and any nation and civilization. So that, I think, is to be valued and why he should be read. And the other reason is also among those who write and review books, literature, art, there is this notion that, you know, you have to keep them separate. You can't have a cause. If you do, then your art suffers. And which I think is an argument, again, is just as problematic mm. um, as the argument of keeping politics out because for reasons of, you know, of politics itself. That, I think, is why he was important. And also because he did it very effortlessly. His uh, beginning with his mm. first novel, mm. but even before that, when he was writing stories and was writing essays, it was about you know an effortless humanity and engagement with uh, people. It was about harmony, and he was a socialist, which personally to me makes him you know because I respond well to that. So, and also you know his in no way did his art suffer. Now, if you're looking at you're looking only at language and literature and beautiful writing, well, yes, of course. I mean, there would be more beautiful writers and more evocative people who wrote evocative prose better than him, perhaps. But at the end of the day, you're looking at a story, something that moves you, uh, that engages people. And I think in that sense, he was remarkable. And also he took risks. I mean, you know, Two Leaves in a Bud mm. was written uh, and it was banned uh, mm. uh, by the British. You know, so then again, effortlessly done. I mean, nobody really talks about these things. He was deeply human and deeply political. And he was a really good artist. All of these things are possible. And that's what we need to remember, I think. Mm. We'll go back to the writing in a little while, but I thought we'd open up another chapter. And uh, I think, Mr. Tiku, I'm going to talk to you about this. Something else that I personally actually find really fascinating about him is his uh, joining the International Brigade, you know, going there during the Spanish Civil War in uh, 1937. And uh, although his involvement was as a journalist, he was writing about it rather than fighting the war as such. And I read a little bit about that. So it was thought that some 40,000 foreign nationals fought with the brigade. So if you'd like to talk a little bit about that period, you know, I mean, you find very few people like that. And these days, I mean, I'd really not be able to find any writers who actually want to go to the front and write mm. about it from that point of view. Yes, you have journalists who are embedded and so on, but beyond that. I think uh, the period during which he was in England was his formative. Mm. And that's when his ideas were shaped and his politics were shaped. And uh, he became a committed writer, as it was used to be said. And uh, joining the Spanish Civil War was only a part of that. But his commitment remained all through right. I mean, because he started writing at the age of 28 and till his end in 98. He was all through very passionately committed mm. writer and he would always engage with 
subject. She was not a kind of an armchair writer. Mm-hmm. And Humra as a fellow writer, because he also started this, um, or he was part of founding the Progressive Writers Movement, and he was very deeply involved mm-hmm. with that. And as Ravi said earlier, this whole thing of not only being politically conscious, but also concerned about this fledgling country, which was still being made, the, you know, the beginnings of democracy, the beginnings of the country. And in that, you have the Progressive Writers Movement and all the, you know, the luminaries, their writing and what that brought to us, not only in terms of writing, but also in terms of the kind of idealism that existed at that time. Talk a little bit about that, please. See, I met him several times, actually many times. And what struck me was his passion. There was something that enthusiasm, passion. And as Ravi pointed out, he was an artist also. So he was extremely sensitive. I mean, everything is to write. There's to be a little sketch at the bottom of it, mm. you know. So, and he was concerned about the country at that time. You know, when I first met him, I think that was in the 80s. He said, I don't know, is mulko kya ho rai? He said, I can't imagine we are the same people who uh, build the Ajanta caves. Um, mm. And are we the same people? As a writer, it's my thing to write. Whatever I feel, whether there's rejection. I mean, his, uh, that novel, The Untouchables, was rejected by 19 publishers. Mm-hmm. But he said, no, this thing has to come up. So, And that time, I think there was this passion. Among, this progressive writers movement came up because of that uh, common cause of mm-hmm. passion to uh, save the country. So he, there was something very, I mean, the, when he spoke, I mean, you felt as if, you know, he's uh, encouraging you in a very indirect way. And then he spoke about his own personal life without any of the positives to mm-hmm. it, all mm-hmm. negatives in a way, I mean, in a way. But he was uh, very, very proud of all those uh, low mm-hmm. phases he went through. He said that made him into a writer. Mm-hmm. There was something different about him and there was life in him. Mm-hmm. So if we were to try and place him in today's milieu and context, mm-hmm. where would his work stand? What do you think is actually this difference? Because you talked a lot about the kind of commitment that he had to social and political and also cultural issues, the things that he talked about, whether untouchability, caste, uh, you know, espousing the cause of the underdog, all of that. So what would be the main difference between that kind of writing and, you know, a committed writer who actually sets an entire generation of readers to think about these problems and these challenges and what we are looking at today, especially the so-called urban writer who's focused on the city, for example. In one sense, it's understandable if someone like him doesn't uh, get a million followers on social media or whatever. The world has changed, you know, not entirely in unfortunate ways, but in many unfortunate ways it has changed. But, you know, it's it was possible. What he was doing was possible at that time. And then also to get popularity because, you know, he became popular among a very, very small number of people who read in English and a lot of them abroad. So all of that was possible for those reasons. It was also uh, now, it isn't as if there aren't people who are committed and who engage with social and political issues now. Mm-hmm. The way it is done is different. For instance, when, you know, if he was around today and he wrote The Untouchable, a book like that, there would be questions about uh, authenticity and about, you know, how can you write about it not mm-hmm. being mm-hmm. done with yourself? Mm-hmm. How can you write about it? And therefore, how authentic is your, to some extent, legitimate? And these things will happen now. But, you know, I don't think that that makes his art any lesser than it was, except that when he was writing it, there were very few people who would have been able to write of that experience in English. And obviously, mm. they would, you know. So I think things would be different now, yes. But what we have to remember is, regardless of how the times would have changed, it's also to do with the person's sensibility. Mm. You have a large vision. Mm. You're interested in the world. You're cosmopolitan. You're secular. You are uh, a person of your village and, and your country and also of the world. Those kind of people are very mm, rare. Very you know, rare, yeah. Sri Krajanand, Kushwant was one. Mm-hmm. And among Hindi writers also, there were many. And I mean, these are the only two that I know mm. of. Just to give an example, how many writers would be able to do what he did, write the kind of books he did for adults and also for children, and both in Hindi and English. Mm. So this is something I discovered only when we, you know, mm. um, I didn't know much about it, but when we were going to have the session I was mm. reading. There are two books that I found fascinating for children, among many others. Mm. One is called Barber's Trade Union. You know, this is for children, by the way. Mm-hmm. Wonderfully written. And another one is Gali Mahalno Ke Khel. This is in Hindi. So there is, uh, he writes about Dattu, Kabaddi, mm. Kanche, mm. you know. And you know, him writing in English didn't mean he was divorced from the realities. Yeah. Of course, it was a different time, the distance between an urban experience and, uh, you know, a mm. rural experience. It wasn't so great, the distance. Mm. It's, hap- it's happened now. So there's one, another thing I found out was there was this Hindustani book trust. And he, together, I think, with Ali Sardar Jafri, they were the editors. 
and there were others on the board. It was privately funded. They all contributed. And this book trust published books of poetry, the best works of the best poets of Hindi, Urdu and Farsi. They were published simultaneously in Urdu and in Hindi. They've now just mm-hmm. So that there would be an emotional connect and so that there, would, there wouldn't be these divisions and people would share, literature would be shared and therefore cultures would be shared. And that's the kind of vision he had for India for adults and for children and mm-hmm. did it in English, did it in Hindi, did it in Urdu, in Punjabi. Well, he, I don't think he wrote in Punjabi, but there's a lot of, you know, Hindustani and mm-hmm. Punjabi words in his English mm-hmm. writing also, in which sense he's a pioneer. So I don't know how much of that is possible now. Yeah? We live small lives compared to people of that time. Mm-hmm. And very constrained lives because you seem to be getting judged all the time. Some people say your level against him is this thing of putting a lot of the stuff which is actually propaganda, putting it into his writing. But it's also that in the sense that you do have a mission and you are saying something. And he says himself, he, he writes somewhere, all these heroes, the men and women who emerged in my novels and short stories were dear to me because they were a reflection of the real people I had known during my childhood and youth. And so this juxtaposition, of course, of reality and imagination, both of which, you know, he uses and which all writers use to a lesser or greater degree. But this, you know, this charge of uh, what kind of balance is it propaganda? Is it writing with the mission? Because and does his writing or the literary quality of his writing, does that suffer as a result? You did talk about it, Ravi, a little bit, but if you could talk, expand on, you know, the works. The, I think the it is important to pull Mulk Prajanand in his historical context. He couldn't have been writing the same thing today. But in his historical context, I mean, his contribution is immense. Mm. Number one, what he does with language, what he does with the themes and ideas. And how they are, and of course he is socially committed. Mm. Of course he is, mm. yeah, I mean, the very title of a book like Kuli or Untouchable mm. tells you something about the kind of his social concerns. Mm. These were there. Mm. But in the middle of all this, he created good literature, great literature. Mm. And uh, it is again impossible to think of an Indian writer way back then mm. who could be on, uh, <coughs> you know, personal terms with people like George Orwell. I mean, how could he do this? He wrote for the criteria. He wrote which I for find. the criteria, yes, Eliot. Yeah. And things like that. And it's amazing the kind of uh, gulfs he bridged. Mm. And this uh, bridging of the gulfs is also evident in his writing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. His, his social concerns, and how he updates them and brings them face to face with current realities. Mm-hmm. There's just one point I wanted to mm-hmm. make is that, you know, unlike many others who would do what you said, you know, using their literature as a vehicle mm-hmm. for some mm-hmm. ideas or ideology mm-hmm. or cause, what happens is the characters they create become almost like caricatures or one-dimensional. Would, yeah. Not one of his characters, at least mm-hmm. I don't think they are mm-hmm. one-dimensional. Mm-hmm. They are very rich. They mm-hmm. have, you know, rich, Yeah, I think yeah. it is uh, the caliber of the writer. I mean, yes. it is not necessary that a, it sh- that a character should be reduced to a caricature yeah. just because the writer has a message. Right. If the writer has the stature, he has the capacity, he has the depth, he can make it uh, multidimensional. Mm. I think Mulk does that. Mm. Mm. You want to add to that? With any of the, you know, you, since you knew him also, you mm-hmm. met him, you talked to him about his writing. Uh, uh, like and that? yeah, I would like to add this. It was just not words. I mean, he lived that sort of life. Mm-hmm. Because when I visited his uh, home for the first time in, in Delhi, Lokaita, I take my children also. Mm. It was something very cheerful and something different. So, indirectly or directly, I asked him that, how come you've done it up this way? Mm. He said, it cost me nothing. Uh, these moras are from this village. Uh, I had uh, this old bed. I had it painted into post office red. These chicks, many local carpenters, I mean, according to him, seven, eight, nine hundred May, he had done the entire place. And that gave me the idea. So, I did a, tried to do my place that way. And he said, yeah, there's no need for carpets. Yeah, do dari, do so ki si, and idhar se, idhar se. So, and he looked happy with all this. There was mm-hmm. a lot of uh, confidence and sort of, you know, he was, what he was talking actually made so much sense. I think it left an impact on my children because they couldn't believe that you can do up these mm-hmm. uh, three rooms in mm-hmm. 800, 900 rupees. And there was nothing in the kitchen, you know, just some biscuits and tea. But then he got something from here or there. This was uh, Hoskar's village with that time, actually mm-hmm. Hoskar's village. And then he showed me the plants and the trees and this, that. He was living with nature, actually. So there was no contradiction that he was not talking uh, and living in some, you know, mm. high fire thing. Ha, no, yeah. no, no, no. Mm. And then he spoke about his personal life, which I think very few people, at least Indians do. His four nervous breakdowns, how he recovered, why, how, his women friends. And there was something very genuine. So I respected mm. him and everything seemed to come from his heart. Till now, I remember the facial expressions and then 
वे इज टू टॉक एंड एज ए नर्वस ब्रेक डाउन होना इज अ वेरी नेचुरल थिंग टू ह्यूमन बींग He said, "You know, if you are really in love, or there's emotions, there's that. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there are setbacks. And then how he recovered each time, mm-hmm. his writing, and then his um, meeting Mahatma Gandhi, and how that ashram living. So everything was there. It's there and open. You know. So I like. It was like a child talking. You know, things. The honesty and the no, sincerity. something very innocent mm-hmm. in a way. I met him for the first time in uh, the Affirmation Writers Conference in the seventies. Mm-hmm. and he invited me over mm-hmm. i was used to be a journalist then right. and um, that is how we our interaction started mm-hmm. and he was and there was something basically genuine basically deeply concerning society as it mm-hmm. exists mm-hmm. and he was very critical of many things many mm-hmm. institutions in our society mm-hmm. for example would you like to elaborate uh, things like i mean uh, social customs mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the hypocrisy of i mean what he used to call mm-hmm. the hypocrisy of the indian middle class mm-hmm. very critical of that especially the indian marriage he was very mm-hmm. critical he said uh, do you think marriages are working no and he himself said about his own personal mm-hmm. thing is not mm-hmm. that he was giving some lecture he said most men you know they just rape their wives in a marriage yeah. <laughs> and they get that <laughs> official uh, sanction to do it and poor woman has no way to go so she keeps sitting there and crying and then uh, what happened in fact one or two of his short stories are based on this mm-hmm. and he said they mm-hmm. can't take uh, sexual abuse but uh, since it's in a marriage so they can't even talk about it and his own love affair the zaj was all there i mean mm. it's like a and for an indian uh, to talk so openly then was actually surprising in a good way i mean so i think i think yeah. there in what you're saying you know for an indian to do that it was because he you know these kind of things come from a position of confidence confidence also, yeah in yourself because now if you look at among the many things he wrote he wrote a book on what is a contemporary indian civilization i think i'm forgetting the exact title mm. but that you know so he was thinking of it in civilizational terms he also wrote a book you know on hindu art the hindu mm-hmm. art mm-hmm. the first but books. not as um he wasn't a bigot by any stretch of the imagination but again even there when he's using the word hindu obviously when he's using the word indian mm-hmm. islamic or sufi mm-hmm. it's indian mm-hmm. you know he's steeped in that mm-hmm. he doesn't need to be taught uh, you know mm-hmm. what are the marvels of our ancient mm-hmm. civilization etc by anybody he knows mm-hmm. that he acknowledges mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. at the same time he also knows what's wrong with us yeah and that, that is not peculiar to as he would say to indian society he was also critical of what was happening around the world mm-hmm. so that's what i mean by people who have a larger vision mm-hmm. and they, they it's about humanity and so when you know you saying unko pata tha ki mura yahan mil jayega dari yahan mil jayegi wo because he was you know he was there he, he was, was there. Uh, he, yeah. he, he he was living that life mm. and he was not going to be apologetic about you know writing in english of the wind was and he mm. was at the same time not also going to glorify everything about mm. india so it's comes from that confidence mm. is what i'm saying mm. and he was traveling around because he gave a background to the traveling bit also mm. he said when all his 19 publishers turned down his uh, novel he had a nervous breakdown that was third mm. nervous breakdown so he came to mahatma gandhi's ashram they was friendly with the american type is there but there was nothing sexual about that friendship it was very platonic and he said that uh, but uh, mahatma gandhi said okay you can stay on but three terms uh, what were conditions uh, you have to wash the latrines every day and no alcohol and no looking at a woman with desire so he said with this american type is as to babysit she had a small child but the rest of the ashram people were jealous or whatever so they told mahatma gandhi is having an affair with her so he told me to get out of the ashram and it is time for you to travel all over india take a train see the villages mm. so that he said exposed me to a bigger that like real india actually mm. he said then i knew what i am doing and what i am not doing so he said in a way i am very grateful that i went to that ashram and how it's kicked out he said otherwise i wouldn't have known what happening in the villages The first time he, he yeah, went sorry. to Gandhi ji mm. in Sabarmati, mm. he went with the man, his manuscript of the, the, the book, huh? the Antarctic, mm. and Gandhi ji told him, "You keep keep it with me. The first thing you have to do is to go and clean all the public libraries, mm. and he had to do it. Mm. So he had that kind of grounding, that kind of commitment, mm. and which was typical, and mm. it it persisted till the last until yeah, even Lokayata he did everything himself. I mean, there was mm. no, I didn't see any." How's help or anything? Mm. Although he was old, I mean, this I'm talking mm. the 80s when I first met him. Everything, even making tea, coffee, whatever, it was just the done thing. And I feel yeah. like I don't know. I was reading, and again, I took this thing down from an article. It also is so resonant with what we have just gone through during this lockdown and COVID mm. and all that, mm. and how his stories actually, obviously, were so. I mean, not only true, but also visually so mm. true mm. of what we have seen. in our time and what he has described so there was a couple of stories which 
I looked at and this is um, a story in which there's this old man, uh, I think it's called Old Bapu and um, very, very, you know, reminds you of the migrants and their these long walks mm -hmm. uh, that they undertook uh, during the lockdown. And uh, he says about that old man who's also walking back, the city was still a mile away and the flesh of his feet burnt where it touched the new hot metal road right through the holes in his shoes. I mean, it could be anybody. Mm. It could be then, it could be now. So of course. Um, these are the sorts of things. I mean, if he was minutely observing, like you said, cleaning out the latrines mm. and, you know, if you've written about untouchability mm. and caste in India, then you need to know where it stems from and what that experience yes. actually is. And then in another story called Birth, uh, there's this heavily pregnant woman who's breaking stones, uh, you mm -hmm. know, along with her father-in-law to make a road. So those are the kinds of images we still see here. Of course. But uh, again, do they resonate with the writers of present-day India? I mean, in a manner, who do you think owns the mantle? Who wears that mantle anymore? I'm sure that, you know, it's an unfair question because uh, we would then only be looking at English language writers because I, I'm presuming that most of us are familiar more with. There are, even among English language writers, you know, it's what is needed is empathy. And I think the best writers of that time and now, they had that. You don't personally have to have, let's say, you know, if you're writing about someone who's been uh, molested, you may not have been molested yourself, but that doesn't prevent you from imagining and writing about that kind of violence and mm. that kind of uh, experience. So there are writers. I mean, I don't want to name just mm. one or two. Mm. The thing would be many young people now, and I suppose at that time also people <coughs> would have said it. They would have said, Are we need, you know, this is too depressing. Uh, for instance, just to give an example, there's a translation of uh, the Hindi writer Sodesh Deepak's memoir about his descent into madness. And many people say it's fascinating, but we can't, it's too depressing. You don't even want to start reading it. But now, once you do start reading mm -hmm. it, you see, because at the end of the day, what you want an engagement with the world, that's the best kind of, uh, you know, reading experience. And that doesn't always have to be facilely entertaining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, there are people who write uh, all kinds of literature now. Um, yeah, I don't want to judge any of them, and mm. I'm not saying Mulkaraj and uh, everybody should follow what mm. he was doing in terms of what he was writing mm. about. But empathy is, is I think, as long as that is around, then his spirit mm. lives. Mm. What about you, Mr. Tikka? I don't think that Mulkaraj Anand would be writing the same thing today mm. as he did way back then mm. in the 30s and the 40s. But his contribution in the 30s and the 40s was a very mm. formative, very constructive. Mm. At a particular stage in the development of Indian English, mm. the idiom of the language, evolving it, tell the Indian reality. Mm. That was his main contribution in the 30s and the 40s. Mm. And it reflected in subsequent Indian writings in English. Mm. Mm. As we mm. So it's like a long yeah. kind of, I mean, we are almost sort of inheriting mm. and then it forms the... Yeah backdrop to what you look at now. No, I would disagree with Mr. Tikku. Mm. I feel if Mulkaraj Anand mm. was alive and writing, in a position to write, he'd be writing very, very strongly in what's happening today's mm. India. Mm. No, I, think, of course, I think what Mr. Tikku was saying, uh, of course, we'd say was, mm. was not that he wouldn't have written about, uh, you know, issues like that, or he mm. would have, uh, it's just that at that time he was writing about what was, what needed to be addressed and what needed to be talked yeah, about. He would be doing the same thing today. Yeah. And in a sense, he used to do that. I mean, if you, in his later years, even when he was not actually writing these things, he was very passionate, passionate. criticizing and shouting about things. Why are things going the way they are? Mm -hmm. But as, you know, he's from the old school and yet very alert. And he was very outspoken. He was not scared. I mean, there could have been rejections or whatever, but he was not bothered. And then again, coming to today and also trying to connect it with what he was also, I guess, not grappling with in so many, I mean, in, in so many words, but generally definitely mm. concerned about was this double-edged kind of sword of progress. So machines and science and technology, because in a lot of his writing, there is, of course, you know, your respect for science and technology and it's, you know, the necessity of having all of that, but also the fact of machines being um, in a manner destroying the old, mm -hmm. simple, mm -hmm. straightforward mm -hmm. life, especially in maybe villages or whatever, this straight way that you had of dealing with nature, with life around. And so now, especially in this whole climate change, deforestation, degradation, soil, water, air, everything poisoned, polluted. I mean, how would he have sort of uh, not find solutions, but definitely to address this as a major problem, because he did even talk about it at that time, like look at machines in a slightly suspicious manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, <coughs> there is a distinction between progress and progressive. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm. uh, he's, uh, he wo used to be critical about material progress. Mm. But uh, in, in terms of ideology, in terms of thinking, he was very pro 
progressive. Mm. It is amazing in until the later years, the way he used to talk about the, some of the social necessities, social concerns was amazing. I mean, even many young people wouldn't do it the way he used mm. to do it mm. because he was very concerned, very, what they call engage, mm. uh, co- very committed with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's just one thing about, uh, you know, when you say technology mm. and it relates to what uh, Mr. Tiku was saying, difference between progress and progressive mm. and that idea of progressive mm. would at some level did embrace technology. Mm. For instance, in Untouchable, which we may now think is naive, one of the things which is seen as, uh, you know, a means to end evil practice mm. of manual scavenging mm. is that the flush toilets were invented mm. and that would solve the problem. Mm. Now, we are in the well into the 21st <laughs> century. The problem has not been not solved. Not yeah. You know, there are flushes. Yes, all right. But there, no, those again are available, you know, to a few. But yeah. people going down into manholes and, you know, manually having Dying to do them. that. And all. Yeah. So he did place his hope in that kind of technology, simple technology, which would have impact lives and bring dignity into the lives of people. Perhaps today he would have rewritten Untouchable Maybe. and said that, you know, almost a hundred years later. Mm. But in so that. many ways, I guess that would mm, yeah. be the case because yeah. then you would still be pointing at many exactly. of the things so, that so, he began I mean, with. At that yeah, yeah. so it, it was a very progressive, as you're saying, a progressive mm. outlook where technology, as long as it served the purpose of, you know, equality and human dignity, I think he would always have championed that. But these larger things where, you know, which is about um, just rampant technology, what is called progress mm. and how that would destroy lives, civilizations, mm. values and mm. prevent empathy because he was also you know, spiritual towards mm. the end and he was looking at other things. So the, as I said, you know, as a person with a large vision who accommodated many mm. of these things, but at the end of the day, anything that served the purpose of humanity mm. that he would have mm. championed. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I think uh, what's not paid adequate attention is Mulkarashan's contribution to the revival of Indian art. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, Margan. Margan, yes. so on. Even the festivals. It was amazing. Uh, mm. Yes, too. Well, that yes. Is true. So, I mean, it was such a time of... It was a renaissance figure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, such absolutely. a time of, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, huge change in every sphere. I mean, literally a building yeah. up of different institutions and edifices, art mm. and, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. giving yeah. it yeah. enough respect, being yeah. part of part of that, that as well. Is, so, so thank you all because you've, I think, brought in many different perspectives to this one writer and his writings and we've covered a little bit of it anyway. Time is, of course, always the problem. But he was, I think, the voice of his time, as you said, and he was, you know, it was a time of nation building and of, you know, democracy, trying to build up these values. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. I think thank we've you. had an interesting discussion. Yeah. You were listening to our national program of talks in which you heard the panel discussion entitled Mulkraj Anand, Writer for All Ages. The panelists were Sri M.K. Tikku, veteran journalist and writer, Humra Qureshi, columnist and writer, Ravi Singh, well-known publisher, and Preeti Gill, writer and literary agent who initiated and moderated this discussion. Produced and presented by Naveen K. Gupta of All India Radio Delhi, this program came to you from the Delhi station of All India Radio.